right, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Corey Norton. I'm part of the sales leadership team here at Orego. Uh, and I just want to say a quick thank you for joining our second installment of the 2023 Orego webinar series. Uh, today we'll be discussing equity and resiliency in government agencies and infrastructure. So our panelists will have a lot of great topics, including things like the current status of our nation's infrastructure, trends we're seeing in equity and resiliency, why building equity and resiliency uh, is an in integral part of the capital planning process, and what we're seeing as, our, as the future of our nation's infrastructure. A uh, few quick notes before we get started. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and we'll provide all registered participants with the recording as well as the slides that we go over today. Uh, we also ask that you please submit any questions throughout the webinar via the Q&A chat box and we will answer as we get towards the end of the presentation. Uh, they'll be covering a lot of topics today, so I'm sure there'll be a lot of great questions. I'm looking forward to, uh, to hearing what you all have, uh, have to add there. Uh, if we can't get to all of the questions during the available time, we will make sure that we do get you a response to your question. Uh, we'll talk to the panelists, we'll talk to uh, the folks here at, uh, on the Orgo team, and we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we get those questions answered for you. Uh, so now I would like to introduce our three amazing panelists for the afternoon. Uh, so starting with Michael Bryant, uh, Michael is the Civil uh, Rights Division Director at Texas DOT. Uh, at TxDOT, uh, Michael has worked on a variety of matters related to the Civil Rights Division, HUB, HUB and DBE issues, uh, comprehensive development agreements, intellectual property, and the agency's information technology outsourcing with NTT data. Uh, Michael's originally from Washington, D.C. and moved to Austin with his, uh, his wife and family in 1978. Uh, he's an alumnus of St. Stephen's Episcopal School, Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, and the University of Texas School of Law. Uh, next, we have County Engineer at Lancaster County, Pam Dingman. Uh, Pam was one of the state's first female owners of an engineering firm, uh, Engineering Design Consultants. Uh, she's highly experienced in project management uh, and design of civil engineering projects. She designed detention and water facility, uh, water quality facilities uh, since the early 1990s. And this experience come, includes numerous water quality and detention ponds in addition to several channel sta st stabilization projects. Um, she also has an extensive experience with subdivision and site design projects, including the design and preparation of plans, spe specifications, cost estimates, in construction advertising and construction administration. Uh, and finally, we have Kimberly J. Williams, uh, who heads up the Office of Innovation for the Metropolitan Transit Authority of Harris County in Houston, Texas. Uh, Kimberly led the implementation of Houston's first autonomous vehicle shuttle service uh, and deployed public-private partnerships to begin Wi-Fi on transit and Metro's new microtransit service, Curb to Curb. Uh, Kim serves as the chair of Team Houston of the Texas Innovation Alliance, uh, a collaboration of regional and state mobility stakeholders. Uh, she's also a member of the City of Houston's Rapid Mobility Working Group, the Smart, Council, uh, Smart City Advisory Council, Resiliency Council, and Rice University's Business Innovation Advisory Board, uh, as, along with the State of Texas Advanced Air Mobility Advisory Committee. Uh, so thank you to the three of you for joining us this afternoon. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to hearing what you have to say on, uh, on the topics of today. Uh, so we're also joined by our senior marketing manager here at Orgo, Orgo Stephanie Pedroza. Uh, so I'll be passing it over to Stephanie to get us kicked off. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Good afternoon, and thank you so much, Corey. And I want to welcome all the members of the audience from my end. And I'm excited to start this webinar discussion as it's generated a lot of interest from the audience and from the looks of it this has been the best attended webinar that Orgo has seen so thank you very much and i want to say that the topic of equity has been something that was not really talked about in like a, a while ago and really didn't receive much attention and now we're seeing more articles and more policies that are talking about how we're building a more equitable and more resilient infrastructure for our country. So in today's webinar, we're gonna discuss 
the state of our nation's infrastructure, as Corey has mentioned. And up there, we can also see that we're going to talk about the trends, equity and resiliency, and what the future of our infrastructure holds. But before we get started, it looks like we're going to launch a quick poll question. So I'll transfer it over to Corey. So just before we get started, I would love to know uh, which of the best which of the following best describes your organization? So are you working with roads and bridges, water and wastewater, transit and rail, broadband, uh, electric grid or green energy or uh, something else? So uh, we'll give you a couple minutes to our, uh, just a minute to, to fill in what best applies and, um, and we'll go ahead and close that out. Give it just a little bit longer here. It looks like we still have some responses rolling in. Um, we'll keep it going for a bit longer. It's always great to see where everyone's joining us from. I think, you know, traditionally in these webinars, we have a really good mix of, uh, you know, people joining from all kinds of different organizations. So this is always, uh, it's always great to see where you're joining us from. Yeah. And I think we can head over with the results. It looks like about 60% of the people all right, so we have a lot of people from roads and bridges, water and wastewater, and rail and transit. All right. Cool. And one more question, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into uh, to the slides here. Um, so, what best describes your role? Uh, project manager, capital planning and finance, engineer, consultant, administration, or other? Um, you know. I was I was quite wrong on the last one, so we usually have a, a very big mix here as well. But uh, if any, if the last question uh, is any result, we'll have a. Yeah. We'll have so we also want to know what agency you're coming from because I want to say the topic of equity and resiliency touches every aspect of every agency, whether you're in rail, whether you're with a water agency, roads and bridges. All right, so we'll go on and show the results. Okay, a lot of project management, a couple of people in engineering, a couple of consultants. All right, so we will start with our webinar discussion. And right now we're gonna show a couple of statistics of what we've seen of what the current state of our nation's infrastructure is. And it's no secret that our nation's infrastructure needs major improvements. And throughout the years, the American Association of Civil Engineers has ranked our infrastructure quite low. And in a recent report, it shows that we're at a C minus, which is an improvement from a D, but it's still not what we would like to see. And it's safe to say that our infrastructure is aging and with recent environmental changes, it's put our infrastructure under stress and it's not as resilient as it was when we built it years ago. Now, from what I heard, or from what I've actually researched and what I've heard, by definition, infrastructure resiliency is the ability to reduce the magnitude and duration of disruptive events. And in the last couple of years, we have seen numerous amount of disruptive events that have happened. So I'm gonna open the question to our panelists. And the first question is, what are your thoughts about our nation's infrastructure and what can we do to improve our nation's infrastructure? And I'm going to start with you, Kimberly, if you don't mind answering that question. Sure. I appreciate it. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you so much for hosting this webinar on this important topic. And it's a pleasure to be here with Pamela and Michael. Um, our perspective, and I'm coming from the public transit world, where we use um, the roadway network as well as the support around that, sidewalks, ramps, bridges, um, all, all things that we utilize. So I would say one of the things, particularly coming out of Houston, we've had some significant um, weather events that we have not expected to see in a generation. We've had two 500-year storms in the span of of five years. We've had an ice storm of all things. Um, so these have highlighted the need and the urgency of bringing our infrastructure up to speed. And I think the way the Houston region has tackled this is 
we have to pool resources. I think previously a lot of the agencies operated in their own space. The textile did roads, you know, the city did streets, the county did drainage. And I think now we're starting to realize with being in such a, a infrastructure deficit that we have to stack or leverage um, these um, um, projects. We can't just do them in silos. And so a good example is the city, the county, Metro, the public transit agency are all working together to you know, make sure as we're building sidewalks that we're also, while the, the road is open, improving the drainage so that we're leveraging that project to get the maximum benefit. I think we can't, again, do it by ourselves. I think that's the only way we can dig out of this hole. So that's what I would share from the perspective of, you know, how we're starting to look at tackling this infrastructure issue. Yeah, thanks. And Pam, what are your thoughts about our nation's infrastructure and what can we do to improve it? Well, I think it's sad that if you look at uh, much of our rural infrastructure has not been funded at uh, the same rates as the urban infrastructure. And I, by and large, am a rural infrastructure person um, with 1,400 miles of uh, center line miles of road that fall under my jurisdiction. You know, with that being said, floods have been a significant issue for us. And um, I don't know if I'm the most lucky or the most unlucky person, but during my uh, nine year tenure, we've had three of the five most significant weather events in the last hundred years. And so in 2015 and 2019, uh, we lost more than 75% of our 1,100 miles of gravel road. And at one point I closed 28 bridges after that 2019 bomb cycle. And today we still have five of those bridges closed. So it's a significant impact uh, on the citizens of the county. But along with that, and, and so I talk about floods, and then I'm going to talk about we're currently in a really big drought. And so this year we experienced for the first time in my tenure uh, grass fires. And I had prepared for fires, but I had hoped they had never would never happen, and we would never have to large scale mobilize our team to be support for emergency services. And I appreciate what Kimberly says about stacking and working with other agencies because. Uh, becoming a fire response team or support for firefighters is much different than day-to-day -day engineering. And so there's some different things out there. We're also, we have a major metropolitan area in Lincoln, Nebraska, and we have um, worked to work with them to make sure that we're not siloed. In other words, that when you cross that boundary from the city to the county, uh, we now work together at the boundary to figure out how can we get the best uh, the best product for the citizens. Yeah, thanks. And now I'm going to kind of transition it a little bit where we're saying that our infrastructure is not a resilient, but we're also seeing it affect the most vulnerable communities. So before we move on to trends, I want to open the discussion. And we talk a lot about equity. How are we going to build more equitable infrastructure? How are we going to build more equitable communities? And what do we mean when we talk about equity in context of infrastructure? And Michael, I'm going to start with you. What would you say we mean when we talk about equity when it comes to public agencies and when it comes to improving our infrastructure? Oh, Mike, you're on mute. We can't hear you. You know, we definitely still have those issues with technology where it's now, can you hear me now? It's not the issue, it's you're on mute. <laughs> oh, maybe try turning off the audio and then turning it back on. Well, we'll move on um, either Pam or Kimberly, if you can kind of say, or if you can help me out and just say, what do we mean when we're talking about equity in terms of infrastructure? Well, for, for us in Lancaster County, the issue gets to be once we leave the major metropolitan area, uh, we, we do have a number of people that live close to the poverty line. And what becomes super significant when we're closing these bridges and roads because they no longer meet the criteria to be open is we now have children who have difficulty getting, getting to school. 
for people who have trouble getting to their medical appointments because uh, and, and we're on a grid system here, a one mile grid system. So maybe now you have to travel an extra four to eight miles to get to school every day. Or maybe you're in an area where the school bus now says they're not gonna, they're not gonna come to. And so we have additional things that have to be worked out. Uh, I closed a bridge in 2019 and then I was horrified to find out that the, the rural school district moved their bus stop to a gravel county road where people were meeting and dropping off 25 children in the middle of a gravel road with no traffic control and a speed limit of 45 miles an hour. So those are the kind of things that definitely affect uh, the citizens and they affect the citizens, uh, the working uh, community and the travel, the school to market routes really much more dramatically uh, out in the rural areas than in the urban areas. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's sad and that's where we still need to keep talking about equity and how we're bringing more equitable infrastructure to our communities. And I guess I'm going to change the question a bit. And then Kimberly, what are some trends that you've seen around equity and infrastructure in agencies and communities? Well, I'll just share. It's great to see this focus on equity and access. Um, honestly, I don't know if it's been at the forefront and how at least in terms of public transit infrastructure, how things have been designed. But I would say in the last five to eight years in particular, um, there's been a focus on it and it's also been a very broad conversation. So it's not just about economics, for example. Uh, Houston Metro has invested heavily in an accessibility program for those with disabilities. And we define disability very broadly. So it could be a neuro um, a, a disability. And so we have developed better wayfinding on the system um, to help people who have different abilities. We have um, really looked at how people access service. Um, you know, is there a good sidewalk there? Is there a great road network? Are the materials we're using um, user-friendly for a wheelchair, a walker, or any mobility device? Um, we are also on the um, service end for vulnerable, vulnerable populations when something occurs. So when the, I mentioned the hurricanes, I mentioned the ice storm. Well, how do people get to warming centers or cooling centers if it's in the summer? Because Houston gets extremely warm. That's a role that we play. And so it's very important for us to work with our partners to identify where those people are, what are those communities that could find themselves being uh, isolated or, you know, or um, cut off from services. And so we look at all of those things. And so I think that's probably been the biggest change trend, if you will, is that people are actually considering equity right and how things are done and looking at it from a lot of different lenses yeah and now another question we're talking more about equity we're trying to break these trends that have we've seen in the past what can you say are some challenges that have arise from incorporating equity and resiliency into your capital programs but also what have been some opportunities that have come from incorporating equity um and pam i'll start with you a softball question. <laughs> uh, we've looked uh, at we've looked we've taken a much more detailed look at are we distributing the funding in an equitable amount around the county? Is there a certain area that we have concentrated on where other areas uh, are suffering because of lack of funding or lack of projects? And it's an interesting place to be as a professional. And the example would be, I have a road in Lancaster County that has three bridges that were all built on the same year. Guess what? They're all bad. Uh, they're all 70 years old. So we know we're gonna have to put a major capital infusion in that road to get it stabilized again. But yet we have other areas of the county where we have failing bridges or uh, failing pipe culverts that are closing roads. So we wanna make sure that we address those issues in a way that's fair to all so that we can get people uh, to school and to their medical appointments and the other things they need to go to. And Kimberly, Kimberly, same question over to you. Yeah, I think probably 
um, the biggest challenge I see is resources. And I think Pamela hit on it, you know, you in, the, in your earlier slide about where we stand. Um, there are so many needs. And so how do you prioritize, right? Um, and so data, I think, has played a very big role in trying to identify where the greatest need is and then, you know, making those priority decisions. Um, I think I mentioned earlier about leveraging opportunities when there are other projects happening to try and expedite, um, you know, the infrastructure. Uh, for example, uh, what uh, Texas Department of Transportation did a, a highway project in the region, and we used that as an opportunity while that project was happening to add a new service to service an area that had been underserved for many years. And so because we paired up on that project, we were able to deliver it faster and, and less expensively if we had done it separately on our own. Um, so I think, you know, again, leveraging those opportunities is critical to kind of closing this gap. But I also think that one of the challenges is with our new normal. So much has happened because of the pandemic. Um, you know, is we're still trying to get a handle on where people are going and where they are. Um, you know, there was so much movement during the pandemic that we need to start looking at our service and really making sure that we're meeting people where they where they live now, where they are, and where they need to go. Yeah, and I'm going to transfer over to our next slide because that you opened up a good point where you said the big thing is prioritizing your projects. So the next question that I'm gonna ask is, how are we incorporating equity and resiliency in all aspects of capital planning from the initiation? Because you have to start with the project prioritization. And I don't know if you wanna elaborate more on that, Kimberly, and then we can ask Michael since we got him back on, on track. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say quickly, I think you have to have a plan. Um, I think it starts there, and I think you saw a lot of cities and counties and municipalities introduce resiliency plans. Um, you know, we lot we do a lot of planning in the work that we do, but um, I think that that's a concept that's relatively new. And so, I think you have to create a plan. I think you have to bring in stakeholders and really understand what their expectations are. And you also have to explain your limitations uh, as a governmental entity. So giving people with the community as many tools and resources, education and training, so they can equip and prepare themselves um, for these type of events. Uh, because it was, as when I first moved to Houston, uh, Katrina was happening in Louisiana, and we saw you know, how easily a government can become overwhelmed. And we just don't want that to happen. Exactly. And I think I was reading, because there's a lot of news articles that say right now with all the uncertainty and all the environmental changes that are happening, the people that are struggling the most are the lower income communities. So how are we helping build a better lifestyle for them and not just for the wealthier people? And Michael, since we have you on board, what is Textaw and your agency doing, but what also are you seeing TechStock do or other agencies do to ensure equity into all aspects of capital planning. Thanks and apologies for the issues with the computer. Um, I think TechStock, we are currently working on updating our resiliency plan. Um, so as Kimberly said, it really does come down to planning. Um, it's identifying those partners that are gonna be key to executing those plans. Um, and that's on a state level, it's on a local level. Um, and, and obviously as a State Department of Transportation, uh, we work with the Federal Highway Administration and the U.S. Department of Transportation on a regular basis to, to put those plans into effect. Um, specifically in Houston, I think um, talking about um, the hurricane issues, um, TxDOT plays a large role in helping to um, uh, clean up some of the, the uh, after effects of, of any sort of um, weather incident. Um, I think we had over 4,000 uh, employees who were involved in cleanup after Harvey um, along the coastal bend. Um, and as we 
look to future planning um, and recently with our I-45 project, um, uh, having the pause lifted on that project um, after a Title VI complaint, um, some of the, the key things that are, are critical to implement, implementing the virtual, not virtual, the voluntary uh, resolution agreement include things like flood mitigation um, and some of those impacts uh, when we build highways. Um, and because we are building highways for the long term, um, you know, it's it's key to have that planning in place um, so that those impacts that are, are able to be identified now, um, you can also start to really think about future planning um, and, and what those impacts may be when we have a significant number of people moving to Texas on a daily basis. Um, I think I last saw in 2022, there were about 1,300 new people coming to Texas every day. Um, as a reference point, TxDOT has a little under 13,000 employees. So every 10 days, we're essentially adding the entire workforce of TxDOT um, is, is coming to Texas. And so um, anything that we do, it's, it's critical to think about long-term planning and not simply solving the problem today, but what, what will be the changes that come in the future. Yeah. And now uh, Pam, if you wanna add on, cause it seems like planning is a big portion, but I'm also gonna ask, how is the state of Nebraska doing it? But also, can you share any successful projects that you have worked on that have included equity and resiliency? Since I know you said you've worked on the maintenance of a lot of the bridges and rebuilding and also fixing bridges. So if you can elaborate on that. So my department made some pretty big changes from 2015. And, you know, as Kimberly mentions that resiliency is kind of a new thing to all of us. And we're all on our own professional journey. And it's interesting that every year there's still more growth that we all need. And so when it comes to resiliency, we learned a lot from our 2015 500 year flood. I'd hoped I wouldn't have to experience another one of those, but the good news is I knew if I did have to, I was prepared. In 2019, uh, we really took the data and we figured out a way to populate our, our spreadsheets and to track all of our sites. So. 2015, we had right around 1,200 sites of damage from that flood. 2019 was the same sort of thing, uh, another 12 to 1,500 sites. And how we became resilient with that is we improved our data and our databases so we could populate all those databases because as both Kimberly and Michael would tell you, FEMA claims are not that much fun. And there's really no amount of data that makes FEMA happy and hopefully you can just get across the finish line and have a successful claim. Why does that become so important in resiliency? Well, if you put the money out to repair the infrastructure and now you haven't been reimbursed for it, you're waiting for that in your budget. And we're already so short funding that the faster you can get that claim uh, in your bank account, the, the better it is for you. Yeah, and I think that's a conversation. We can, we can have a whole webinar discussion on how to fill out all of these FEMA um, policies that are coming over. But another question that I want to touch on, because I think it's something that is of interest from everyone in our audience, and Michael, this is going to you since you're in charge of the Civil Rights Department. How can we ensure that DBE and equitable principles are part of the standard procedure in annual planning? So how can we bring in more equitable businesses into the process? Um, I think from my perspective, um, and I think some of this is my opinion and some of this is also um, the department's position is, um, especially when there's federal funding and there's federal assistance on projects, the DBE program is an essential part of that delivery. Um, without, without small businesses of all types, including uh, DBEs, um, I don't think we have the ability to get all the work done. I mean, I think most states and, and from my role as chair of the AASHTO Committee on Civil Rights um, in talking to my colleagues across the country, um, we all face similar challenges in, in identifying um, not only the businesses that can do the work already, but also looking for new businesses to supplement all the work. Um, in Texas, um, it's sometimes great to be be large, but it, it presents those extra challenges. Um, we're about to, um, I think for 2024, we'll have a unified transportation program, which is our 10-year plan, 
that's going to be around a hundred billion dollars over 10 years. And the only way to deliver that is with more businesses who are capable um, and available to do the work. Um, so it's it's key for us to make sure that they are, are part of that. One of our, um, when we talk about the definition of equity, um, I don't know that we in at text.. have an official definition that we use, um, but when we look at our vision statement, one part of that is is economic inclusion. And that's all about small businesses. It's all about disadvantaged businesses. Um, and I think during my intro was mentioned HUB, which stands for historically underutilized business businesses, which are part of our state program. Um, and there is absolutely no way to do the work um, without more businesses who are capable. Um, and so it's imperative on all of us. And we work with our partners with our unified certification program, um, which includes the city of Houston as one of our partners uh, to identify, get businesses certified, make sure we're providing adequate training, um, and then also making sure that we're connecting them to the right people within our agencies so that they can get the information that they really need. Because I shouldn't be their their last person to talk to. My my goal is really to be a conduit and make sure that they're talking to the right people who can who are subject matter experts, whether it's landscaping or asphalt um, or some various form of engineering. Um, those people need to talk to those those individuals who can provide them um, real time information on not just what contracts are available, but um, also when we have people come in and maybe have some difficulties on a contract or have difficulty winning contracts to take advantage of the opportunity to have those conversations to understand what they can do better the next time when the next bid is available or the next contract opportunity is there. And I see a lot of questions coming in, so we will answer questions at the end of the presentation. So keep them coming. And now I'm going to shift it over, but before we go into the next slide, but I think a lot of how we can provide more equitable and more resilient infrastructure is the public engagement aspect of it. So how are your agencies getting more equitable public participation for the planning process? And what have been the most effective strategies that you've done in your agency to get more equitable public engagement? And Kimberly, I'll start with you. And you know, that's a great question. And I would just honestly say it's still a work in progress. I know all of us, all the agencies and the entities, we connect with all the trade associations, the affinity groups, we go to all the meetings, but um, just putting on a previous role as the deputy chief procurement officer for Metro, I always found that people still seem to be surprised. You know, when the bid comes out, they're always like, oh, well, I didn't know that was out or I missed that. So I still feel like there is work to be done um, to really get that conversation happening, uh, creating that awareness. Now, one thing that happened during the pandemic that I think is helping to close that gap is um, there, are, there are companies that have developed, that have created um, directories, if you will. Um, we uh, adopted one during the pandemic where we encourage everyone to apply. So it's not just that local company registering on its local agency's database, but there's a wider national database that you can also sign up for that all the agencies have access to. So it expands your reach um, beyond the local level for both the agency and for the small business. And I also want to just address the elephant in the room when you talk about DBEs and SVEs. There's still a lot of feelings among primes that it's a burden or it's unfair. Um, we There is a lawsuit now challenging the federal DBE program. And I would say, again, um, you know, looking at it from an agency procurement perspective, when we don't have adequate bidders, for our work, we get um, less quality and more expensive projects. I mean, it, having small businesses competing for work only makes the process and the projects more competitive and gives you more options to choose from. 
which has uh, long-term benefit to the agencies as well as to your economic development in your communities. So I think we need to start changing our mindset and seeing this as a need to make sure that we're getting the best in-class vendors across the board at the most competitive cost. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's a message that we should be sending out to everyone in the audience, but also everyone. It's how are we going to bring in more DBE businesses into the bidding process? And Pam, I want to know, like in Nebraska, do you know what the process of public engagement is? Since you were talking a lot about the rural areas, how are you bringing in those con constituents into your public engagement process? Uh, well, in regards to the constituents in the rural areas, we've really tried to reach out a number of ways and it's a new day and, it, and that's also a work in progress. You know, are you reaching out on Facebook or Twitter? Uh, we've even had some success reaching out on TikTok, which just kind of blew my mind. Uh, we had a viral video in surveying practices uh, that that really caught, caught fire. You know, it's a new day for how do you reach people? You know, you push the social media, you send out letters, you put up message boards. And it's interesting that it's kind of like Kimberly said, people will still say, well, that caught me by surprise. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, all you can do is just keep the message out. I think the in the rural community, the message boards have been a really good way to get attention. But then we try to be really careful with them that we don't want to get people so they're desensitized to it. And it, it's really a matter of messaging, but not messaging too much so that people don't become desensitized. So all the messaging is out there because there's so much information we're all being just bombarded with these days. And I'm gonna ask one last question and this is going to Michael because I think it's really important to include more disadvantaged businesses, but how can we encourage more businesses to submit their proposals for these projects? And I don't know if you have worked with that or on that aspect. Um, I think we always deal with the challenge of, um, I, I would say it's misconceptions. Um, and unfortunately, some of those misconceptions are based in someone's reality. Someone had a bad experience with TxDOT and as they tell people about their experience, others then say, well, I'm not going to mess with TxDOT. I'll deal with the city of Dallas. I'll deal with Travis County. Um, I'll go do, you know, commercial work. Um, so I, I think a lot of things, and this really goes to a much bigger thing than just the, the DBE issues. Um, a lot of the issues we face as a Department of Transportation um, have grown beyond simply you're putting a road from A to B. We don't like it. Let's have a conversation about it. We'll fix it. Um, again, you know, with, with our Title VI issues, um, you know, we've had, you know, discussions and, and efforts related to housing, related to all the things that I think have been mentioned today, you know, getting people to their doctors, getting people to childcare, getting um, people to any sort of goods and services, avoiding food deserts, all those things. Um, when it comes to getting uh, DBEs and other small businesses to participate, um, I think our goal and the motto that our division takes is that big opportunities start small. And so many of the DBEs, I think, come into it as I can only be a subcontractor. Um, so we are trying to get them to expand beyond simply programs that are based on their DBE certification to understand that there are maintenance projects all across the state that don't require DBE certification. Um, and as Kimberly mentioned, making sure that we get enough bidders on those projects is important to see where we can um, save costs because most of those projects are low bid. When it comes to professional services, those are all based on proposals. Um, our department, um, our professional engineering procurement services division started a program called Drive, um, which is about bringing in DBEs um, in a mentor protege relationship with larger companies that have had, ex had success doing work for TxDOT and helping them to understand where they can fit in and also understanding where they can start to bid um, and submit proposals as a prime um, and building on those mentor protege relationships. There may be things that are beyond their scope, but with that new relationship, they're able to bring in other partners um, to deliver all the necessary uh, services under that contract. So it's really, um, 
I think it's a it's a one on one conversation. Uh, we're going to attempt to contact every DBE in our state directory this year um, in order to one make sure um, who's trying to do the work because we know who shows up on our contracts when it comes to reporting. But when when we're looking at that next group of a thousand or two thousand firms that tried it once and then gave up, we've got to reach out to them on a one on one conversation uh, to try to pull them in because we can do all sorts of public engagement from, uh, you know, outreach and all those things. But until we talk to people individually, it's hard to make sure you're capturing the right people. Um, and I think that goes to some of the efforts we've done on um, our public engagement for projects. Um, there's a, you know, all the new tools that are out there. Um, one of the few benefits of COVID was was the adoption of these virtual platforms, um, which certainly makes some some meetings easier. Um, but again, at the end of the day, when you put a map in front of someone and they get to write a comment and show you where they live in relationship to the things that are important to them, that's where I think you get the most feedback um, and you really see the people's uh, and, and individual's passion come out um, because those are the things that matter. They may not care about you know, 90% of your project, but there's 10% that impacts them on a daily basis. And those are the, the difficult things that I think we're trying to solve. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next topic and those are all great points. But before we move on, we have a poll question. And this is along technology implementation for equity and in public infrastructure. So if you can take some time, what are the challenges that you see when implementing new technology for equity and in public infrastructure? And this will lead us into what the future of infrastructure holds. I know Pamela and Kimberly definitely talked a lot about data, bringing in a lot of data. So we want to know what does the future of our infrastructure holds? How are we going to do it to improve it, make it more resilient, but also make it more equitable for everybody? So we'll launch the poll for a couple of minutes and you can take the time to answer the question. And we will leave some time at the end. We have a lot of questions coming in from the public. So that's very exciting that everyone's quite engaged. All right, we'll give it a couple more minutes. Looks like 30% of the audience have answered the question. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and show the results for the sake of time. But, okay, interesting. So it looks like the high cost of technology and infrastructure upgrades is a big one. Limited access to digital skills and among certain populations, certain privacy and data security and lack of time. All right, so we're gonna go on to the future of infrastructure and Pam, what are your thoughts about where the future of our infrastructure is going and our planning and our capital planning? So I'll start with you, Pamela. Thanks. I do think it's a new day for infrastructure and that we're in a time, uh, and it's, it's a bit of a humble time, where based on the assets that I have in Lancaster County, ultimately we're going to have to tell people that we may not be able to keep their road or bridge open and we have to look for some sort of alternative, which is, is really unfortunate. Along with that though, we are trying a lot of new things, a lot of new technology that maybe I wouldn't have embraced it uh, as a professional five or 10 years ago, but I'm embracing it now to try to figure out a way to get this infrastructure just to last another five or 10 years and what is a cost-effective fix for those things. Uh, an example of that would be uh, foam injection of bridge abutments. It's not something I would have considered uh, five years ago. However, uh, it repaired a substantial number of our damaged bridges after the flood of 2019. So just continuing to focus on those sort of things. And Kimberly, what are you seeing for the future of our infrastructure moving forward? Well, you know, particularly the, since this slide looks at technology and infrastructure, one of the things that I'm seeing is a 
is a renewed focus and development of what we call transit asset management programs um, and using technology like sensors to tell you when the infrastructure is suffering from some type of distress to where you can respond faster um, and even more so plan ahead. Um, these sensors kind of give you an idea of the useful life of a structure or where there might be some type of mechanical failure where you can kind of plan for that financially, plan for that in terms of resources and response. Um, I also work in the autonomous vehicle space and one of the new use cases that has been talked about, um, some of the community have seen like the Google cars going around collecting information for mapping. Um, and if you're in an area like Houston, it has the AV grocery delivery service, Neuro. So the question has come up, since these vehicles are driving around collecting you know, da data for mapping, could it also tell municipalities about potholes, about curb damage, um, anything like that, that, you know, again, that stock stacking, that leveraging um, to use this data for multiple purposes. And I, I think you'll start to see that use case bear out as a way of helping um, government spaces like Pamela's have a better handle and awareness of where uh, resources should be um, allocated you know, because they know ahead of time or they've identified some type of issue in the infrastructure. So those are some of the trends that I'm seeing. Yeah, thanks. And Michael, what are you seeing for the future of our nation's infrastructure? I think for us, um, we recently um, in 2022 uh, updated our ADA transition plan and self-inventory. Um, and it used a lot of technology um, for identifying, um, especially the sidewalk curb ramp uh, issues across the state. Um, and so having, uh, using some technology, um, GIS and other things that are, are similar to other programs uh, that TxDOT uses, it puts it in a format that I think is easier for us to explain um, to engineers, but also um, allows a little more uh, openness and transparency for the public um, to identify things and report issues that they have. Um, I also think for TxDOT in particular, we were hit uh, a few years ago uh, with a ransomware attack. And so I think cybersecurity um, has become extremely important, um, uh, especially you know when it comes to the various types of data um, that a DOT uh, may, may have in its records. Um, and then I think the machine learning and AI um, has some positive impacts. I've seen um, an article recently that talked about using AI to start to uh, identify, again, things related to uh, accessible inventory um, to identify issues with sidewalks and curb ramps and things. And so figuring out how those things can play in um, to, to make things better, but also being aware that sometimes good things have some negative consequences and making sure we can mitigate what those issues may be. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, it's definitely being open-minded. We are in a new era, we are in a new age. So we do need to incorporate technology, but also we need to make sure that we're smart about it and safe about it as well. Well, we are gonna move on to audience questions because we have a lot of audience questions. So Corey, I will hand the stage over to you. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've gotten a lot of, of very thoughtful questions today, so I'm hoping we can uh, we can get to several of these. Uh, and then again, if we do not get to your question, we absolutely will get it answered for you and reach out uh, uh, to address that. Um, so let's kick things off. Um, Kim, you mentioned earlier that you know it's, it's a great thing that people are consider considering equity right now, and and oftentimes it's the first time. So a lot of the questions that we're getting are around the how. So for integrating equity and resiliency into um, you know, county planning or Michael in your case, DOT, how, they, how have you ensured that the principles are a part of the standard operating procedure for prioritization? Um, 
rather than ad hoc considerations for individual projects. Uh, so can and really- then, Yeah, I, thank you for that question. Um, I think Pamela mentioned it earlier, a lot of this is new for us. So we're, we're still working through some of those questions, but all of our respective agencies collect a tremendous amount of data. And I think that's where it starts. And so um, we, we talked about data, uh, we talked about having plans. And so for Houston Metro, I'll just give an example. Um, we uh, developed a resiliency plan. And in that we do look at equity. Um, are the areas that we're operating in, and typically there are under-resourced areas. So are we looking at what we can bring to the table to improve those areas? If that's land use, if that's the materials that we use in that environment, is it tracking our carbon footprint in those areas to make sure that we are not impacting, having a negative impact on those areas. Um, And so I think that's part of it, looking at the data, developing a plan, engaging with stakeholders to find out where the need is. And then a priority process needs to happen because uh, as both Michael and Pamela mentioned, we have a lot of people to serve um, and only so much resource to do so. Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's, that's really great insight into that. Um, one of the questions that, that comes up, and I would love to to give this question to, to Pam and Michael here in a minute as well, but when you're developing those plans, what are some of the success metrics, uh, criteria that you're looking for to to build in there? And, and how are you measuring these projects to, to deem them you know, successful at, at, at the end of the day? So one of our projects uh, the last couple of years has been to get an inventory of the condition of our pipe culverts around the county. It wasn't a very, uh, it it was a big project for us because we have approximately 6,900 culverts around the county and we have an inspection team of five. And so it it was a multi-year process. And what was humbling about it is you're going from having no system that gives the criteria um, of how your pipe is rated other than a superintendent saying, hey, that's a bad pipe. But the question is, are there pipes out there that are worse than it that need to be more of a priority? So the first time we went through our system, what we really sadly discovered is we didn't necessarily collect the right data. And so incrementally, we had to go back through the system a second time to update uh, that database in order to be able to make data-driven decisions. Now, the humbling thing is, is through this, we discovered that 20% of our culvert inventory are rated quarterly. So how do you, how do you get to that when you only have funding for, you have 2,000 pipes that are bad and you only have funding for 100 a year in a good year? <laughs> so those are the questions. Um, but setting up the systems and the data to, to be able to logically and systematically look at that and make sure that you're addressing the, the overall needs of the system is, is critical. And you might not get it right the first time. We're in new area. We're just in completely new areas. That's great. And and then Michael, you know, with TxDOT, how are you all ensuring that, you know, that is built into, or is this standard rather than, than individual projects? Uh, I mean, it's an ongoing process, and I think, you know, trying to make sure that everyone understands, um, one, what the requirements are. Um, You know, Title VI is a blanket over everything that we do, and from Title VI, you have so many other things that have grown out of it, including the ADA um, and environmental justice, I think, are are two of the big ones that have come out of it. Um, And so trying to make sure, in addition to having policies and procedures and those things. I mean, all that part is great. Um, and it's certainly working in a world of engineers, having very, you know, detailed specific steps is, is, is a great step, but so much of it really comes down to, again to, um, the particulars of each project, you know, our, a design build project is different than, you know, a, a standard maintenance project. And so what the impacts are, um, you can make guesses on them, but I think it's, it's once you're seeing, um, who's impacted, doing the various either Title VI or EJ analyses, 
um, to make those determinations. And, you know, EJ adds an element of low income. And so you've got to make sure, um, obviously, that you're you're not impacting, you know, people of, of lesser means, um, because then I think it goes into things that we talked about earlier that then you really get into those conversations about transit, about sidewalks and, and things that help people move around. Um, so it's, I wouldn't say that we have, you know, a, a, a checklist in, in the sense of, hey, you met all these 25 things, so therefore that one's okay. Um, I think there are, are check, checklists that are really uh, ideas um, to, that you should think about. And then for one project, it may be, you know, 20 of those things are an issue, but for another project, there may be another 50 ideas that need to be considered. Um, so it really is on a case by case basis. Um, I, th I think we probably have time for one more, and I, I want to get to this one because you all have addressed it in, in different ways today. So, you know, Michael, you mentioned 1,300 new people moving to Texas every day. And um, Kimberly, you know, I think, you know, if I'm not wrong, Houston's very close to that 5 million. Houston, or sorry, Harris County is, is very close to that 5 million resident mark right now, if not over. Uh, and then, Pam, you're, you're balancing... Um, growth in the city with growth in rural areas. Uh, so one of the questions that we got is, you know, it seems like a lot of people are in areas where there's a, a lot of new development happening. Um, and as part of the permitting process, I think a lot of that is, you know, being fronted by the developers and, and therefore they're building in more affluent areas. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, it's coming at the cost of, improvements to um it's coming at the cost of improvements in in the you know less advantaged areas um unless you know those that infrastructure is is at or near, near a failure point um as part of that the cost of living rises in those communities and it's it's creating a, a widening um equity and, and racial gap um in those areas so what are some things that you think can be can, can be done to address uh, that gap that's being created with new development? And uh, Kimberly, we can we can start with you on that one. Well, you know, um, as the public transit agency, uh, we would hope that these developers embed public transit and mobility options for their new tenants or new renters uh, or new uh, visitors, if it's a retail facility, um, we, we, we get into the, the, the demographic conversation a lot in public transit. Um, it, it's usually very wealthy stakeholders who are opposed to public transit, not realizing that's a lot of how their employee base accesses them. <laughs> so. I think they do have to go in tandem. So I, I would say just for the sake of time, you know, my quick response would be to embed public transit, embed mobility into your project, mobility for all users uh, into your respective projects. It doesn't compromise it. It actually brings economic benefits and as well as environmental benefits. So it's a win-win. Yeah. 